uh, you are going to speak about uh, KPZ universality and iterates of random monotone maps. Right. So KPZ is a, uh, what's the name of KPZ? Kardar, well, Parisi, and Zang. That's correct. That's correct. There are two different KPZs, and that's exactly Kadar Parisi Zang. Well, thank okay. you very much for inviting me and giving opportunity to speak here. Yeah, I also had fantastic time when I was chair in back to 2017, and I actually can just join everything which Tamara said about fantastic atmosphere, support, uh, welcoming. Everything was great, and the school, uh, the program, also went very well. I think so. Uh, this. I asked Pascal and I said, is it a uh, kind of uh, celebratory talk or scientific talk? And it's a scientific talk. And maybe I'm making some uh, wrong choice. Uh, the name of the, the title is a little bit sound technical, but I want uh, to explain a few things. And I think it will be some take home message, uh, which is most important. So I want to, since the audience is mixed, I want just to give a feeling of the subject and maybe what we are thinking about developing of it. Okay, so it's KPZ, and this is three physicists, Kadar, Parisi, and Zhang, and I will not write the names, just pronounce them. And Parisi, of course, a Nobel Prize winner. Probably Kadar was a driving force before of this project, and Zhang was his PhD student, and he then came to Rome and got Parisi interested, and they wrote a paper. But uh, what we really understand now about KPZ University goes much farther than the uh, subject, what what was discussed in the paper of Kadar Parisi and Zhang. So it's a really fascinating phenomena, very general, and a lot of things we uh, believe we know the answers, but we don't understand how to prove them, and all many mechanisms are still not clear. Uh, but phenomena is extremely general. So what is the phenomena? Uh, the only restriction which is not so general is that it's happened in two-dimensional space. So you kind of have a plane, and then you have some random landscape of hills and valleys on this on this two-dimensional plane, like here, like uh, you know, kalangs, mountains, valleys, whatever. And this is a random landscape, and uh, you think it's translation variant. So it is random, but what you see here and in other places have the same distribution. That's natural assumption, and you also assume that. What you see here and far away is either independent or very weakly dependent. And again, it's a natural assumption because these places do not communicate with each other. And then the question you are studying is the following. Living on this two-dimensional random landscape, so this is non-random two-dimensional plane, but there is landscape over there. And then what you want to do is take two faraway points, A and B, and so they live in this landscape. And you want to find geodesic connecting these two points. And of course, since you have random landscape, there will be some random curve connecting these two points. So you probably don't want to go very high in the mountain. You try to find the way which doesn't take you either very deep or very high. And uh, that will be gamma AB, which will be this geodesic. Now I'll have also a parameter, which will be L. And L is just distance between A and B on this plane. So this is this. If I connect them directly, it will be length L. And so questions which you want to look at, and actually you can look at much more general things, is the following. So this is a random variable, this, uh, this uh, geodesic. So you want to understand what are the lengths of this geodesic? And this is exactly, that will be a random variable taking real value. And you also want to see how far you deviate from the straight line. So since endpoints are fixed, maybe I want to look something in the middle and see how big is this I would call it delta. Delta on gamma will be transversal fluctuation. And of course, I will look at it not for fixed value of L, but when L goes to infinity. So what you can say about distribution of this thing and this thing? And then there are universal predictions about that. And universality means that it doesn't depend on what is the probability distribution of your hills and valleys. If you're not too crazy about this distribution, the answer we'll see will be universal. So what you will see will be the following, that of course the length will be proportional to L capital because the farther away the more distance it will be. So it will be some non-interesting constant, constant time L which you subtract, which is kind of mean value type of behavior, uh, kind of low large numbers, uh, yeah, the ratio is here. 
And then the answer is that, well, how you, what you have to normalize? What are the fluctuations around the thing? And it turns out that fluctuation here will be order L to the one third. And that is one of the universal exponents. Let's put number alpha, which is not so important. And then this is converges to, well, universal distribution, which goes Tracy Vidom distribution. And in this particular case, when you fix two endpoints, it will be what people would say, GUE, Gaussian unitary ensemble. But forget about this, it doesn't matter. It's particular distribution. It is as universal as Gaussian. It's not Gaussian, but it appears in a very general setting of this type. And uh, I cannot write formula for the density of this distribution, but everything is known about this, how the tails behave and so on and so forth. Actually, tails are super exponentially decaying. Uh, they're decaying even faster than one of the tails decay faster than Gaussian. Now, this guy will also be a random variable, and the order of the thing will be L to the two-third. So that would be typical fluctuation in the transversal direction. And if you normalize this on this L to the two-third, and beta alpha is just number, not very interesting, then it also converges to universal law. And that is take-home message, that whenever you do anything like this, you will see this universal law for transversal fluctuation, you will see this universal law for the lengths, and uh, the task is to understand why is this so, why it is universal. Now, uh, as I said, there are, you can formulate it in a more general way, and I'll do it in a moment, but uh, in this form of ge random geometry, this is not proven. This is conjecture. And there is a plenty of results of proving this type of result for concrete models which have certain integrability flavor. So there is some miracle happening in these models which allow you to get exact formula. And this confirmed this, confirm this universality for this case. But if you go beyond of this universality, uh, of this integrability things, you are not in a good, uh, you, you still don't have mathematical results. Now, that basically I would say one third and two third, that's where Kadar Parisi Zang appearing here. Kind of. So they didn't know Kadar Parisi Zang that there is exact universality. They didn't know about Tracy Vidom. They didn't know about that. They knew just these scales, L to the one third and two third, right? So it's a rare case when a mathematician kind of got results uh, which were not known to physicists in a physically motivated problem. There are not so many examples. It's one of them. All right, so that is kind of a take-home message. And then I'll go a little bit further in trying to go in direction of a second part, what is in my title, which is iterates of monotone maps. So where these monotone maps appear. So basically there are two aspects here. Well, first of all, there are two aspects in the whole problem. There's integrability aspect, that the answers kind of can be studied. We know that Tracy Vidom law is appearing here. And the universality aspect. It is not always integrability and universality come together. In this case, they come together. So it's a very nice and interesting situation. And second thing is that there are two things. So delta is kind of geometrical object. And L is a, is a length, so it's a little bit different. It's not it's related geometry, but it's a number. And so there are two aspects. Uh, you can, so in a formulation which I do in a moment, which is a little bit more uh, precise, uh, the, what was length would be the action of a certain trajectory, but geometrical motifs will still be there. So there are two types of universality, universality for geometrical object only for lengths, and they're a little bit separate, it will we'll discuss later, uh, but they sh they're related, but they can be discussed separately, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not precise, I didn't write formula for geometry for this profile of uh, landscape of the of hills and valleys. So what maybe, it's better just to take discrete setting, and discrete is okay, because we're talking about large distances. And phenomena happen in large distance. So the smaller, the, if you fix the unit of scale, it removes many difficulties, but phenomena is still there. And so that is a plane. And then what means disorder? You just have collection of random variables, and I would call coordinates x and i, but this is, will be time, and this will be space, but it's just mentally, doesn't matter. And uh, this will be collection of i d, so this x i is any point of that two, two dimensional lattice. And this collection of identical distribution, independent identical distribution, random variables. 
So this is, this is my disorder. So this is kind of profile of hills and valleys. And then the, the, uh, the game you're playing, you take a point. So that will be my direction of time, which is denoted by i here. And this will be direction of x. This will be space. And then you want to go, say, if I mimic the previous one, I go to a particular point, or I cannot fix this point. I take random walk on the lattice, going, say, from the origin, random walks of length n. n is the same as L, more or less, before. And then what will be the length of it? It would be what is called action, but this is the same as. So for particular pass gamma, which is a random walk, the action of it will be random variable, which is sum of these values along the points you visit. Right? So you take sum i from 0 to n, and then you take psi gamma i i, so you just take summation of all the things. So for example, you go, and this is a radioactive disorder, and you want to go and take as little as possible. And so the geodesic is a, a, is a trajectory of radar walk, uh, which has minimum. So I want to minimize A, and this minimum value will be exactly the length of geodesic. But I am interested also in geometrical object of this type. So how much it fluctuates from the initial position here. Now I'm not fixing the endpoint; it can be anywhere. So how it fluctuates. And I want to look at this object. And I want to understand why it is universal. It will not depend on the distribution of this disorder. And uh, so that's a problem. And uh, what I'll do next, I would uh, introduce the, this uh, monotone maps. So what are these monotone maps? In, this, in the models you care about, you don't have to worry about uniqueness, like gamma could, gamma is high probability unique? Well, this of course is unique if there's a, uh, the distribution of psi is uh, continuous. I mean, if it, is, it has density, then it will be unique. But normally it's not an issue. You don't want to have very degenerate situation. So if this psi takes value 0 and 1, that might have some percolation aspects which I don't want to discuss, right? But you can avoid this if you introduce temperature. And the moment you introduce temperature, this will disappear also. So that is not an issue, but I don't want to go into it. So I want to do the following. I want to look at this in the following thing. So now my n will be very large, but I'll have many strips of length n. So it would be totally n times n, the total time, but n is large. It's much larger than n, and this is much larger than 1. So the old strips are very large, but there are many of them. And then I would consider uh, minimizing curves coming from different points of my lattice and ending up at this thing. And uh, then I would record this thing coming from different points of my lattice. What are their position when they cross this thing? And what I will see that, of course, Many of them would like to go the same direction because they're minimizing. So what I will see that uh, the big chunk of them would come up to the same point on the lattice. So if it's not lattice to very small interval, and then there will be another chunk coming here. They actually continue. And, and they would maybe meet again somewhere here and then continue like this. But then another chunk and so on. And the map I want to consider is a map from here to there. But they live for a very long time. And it will be map T01, which goes from time 0 to time 1. And then I would play the same game, but starting at that level, forgetting about this level. So it would be from time 1 to this time. And then we get another map, T12, from here to here, and so on. Then I'll get a sequence of maps. And what is important about this map is that they're all monotone. You cannot cross. If you walk to the right, you will stay in the right. You can get to the same point, but you're not cross. So they're monotone maps. And they are, you see here, what if I kind of rescale it on n and n, you'll see that even if it's small interval, if you see that the lattice, it will be one point. So there will be what you get that these maps in the limit which I'm considering, all of these maps will be monotone and piecewise constant. Mm -hmm. 
they cannot cross, yeah. So the graph of this map would look something like that. It kind of goes along the diagonal. It's a random map. All of them are random maps. It's like this. So these are points, the values that uh, this map is taking, and those are intervals on in which it takes the same value. An inverse map is also monotone and uh, piecewise constant. You just have to change the orientation of the thing. So that's how this map is looking, but they're random. So you have sequence of these random maps. And what is, you will see in KPZ, that you will see that the displacement of this map uh, after, so if I rescale time, so n now will be time one. So now these intervals will be very large, but they will be order n to the two third. And that's exactly two third we saw before. So I rescale by n to the two third, I rescale time, then these intervals will be order one. So that is what you have here, all the one things. And you have sequence of the things. But still, if you do add capital of them, the displacement will be order n to the two-third. The same two-third as before. And you come to a situation where you just forget of the previous problem. You can have sequences of maps. They're correlated, because if they will not be correlated, the displacement will be square root of n, but not n to the two-third. Sequences of map, they're stationary sequences, distribution of this, this, this is the same. They are not correlated in X, weakly correlated, but they're correlated in time. And they have particular scaling when you iterate N of them. And so the conjecture which come here is that you can forget about the previous problem and you just say, if you have these sequences of maps of this type, and if you fix N to the alpha, you are not saying even though this two thirds, then it describes there is only one limiting statistics which is consistent with this data. So for every alpha, there is a particular statistic of the things. And the only one statistics which survives in the limit of large n, that's it. And that kind of extends the idea of the universality of KPZ from a much larger setting. First of all, it's one parameter family of problems, the parameter alpha. And second of all, it is not related to the geometry, it's just monotonicity. They're not going through each other. And uh, piecewise constant, it, this is less important. Montanist is crucial. That is behind it. And that's what we are trying to achieve. And that set of ideas appears during the program which we had here in, uh, in the institute during the program. And we have partial results in this direction at the moment. Uh, we, uh, the case of alpha equal to one half, we understand pretty well. And there are mathematical results about it. That's correspond to the fact when to the case where these maps are independent. So when you map are independent, then you do, you, indeed you converge to universal behavior, which will be, uh, we understand this behavior. It's very simple stuff. It is, uh, it converges to what is called, for those who heard these words, but I'm not going very much into this, it is coalescent Brownian motion. There is a process of coalescing Brownian motion, and time one map of coalescing Brownian motion, that would be limiting behavior of the thing. In this case. So that is a fixed point. You can think that this is a randomization group, randomization transformation acting here. And what you see for KPZ, it's a fixed point corresponding to alpha equal to two third. And uh, this time one map for Halesi fraction of motion corresponds to alpha equal to one and a half. But there are fixed points for every alpha, and uh, they are stable that if you keep, if parameter alpha by some reason is given to you by the physics of a problem or by something, then they will converge to this fixed point. But if you start with two different alphas, they would have different limiting behavior. So there is, from point of view of randomization ideology, there is neutral direction corresponding to alpha and stable across for fixed alpha. And that's what we try to achieve. We also have partial results, mostly numerical for n to the equal to third. We came up with sequences of map of this type coming from what is called coalescent fractional Brownian motion this Hertz exponent to third, and they seems to be numerically having the same statistics as in KPZ. So indeed, it looks like KPZ can be extended at least in geometrical fi figures of what are the statistics of the point fields appearing here, what are the statistics of these maps, and extending farther than normal KPZ scaling, uh, setting and extending farther than for two, two third. But it's an open problem, and there are many, many open questions. In particular, there is an interesting question is suppose I proved 
constructed this exponent with a geometric object. Can I recover the ARI process, the Tracy Widom distribution? Ha, ha, by having this information, can I recover the uh, universality, not of geometric object, but of this, of this actions itself, which many people are interested in, which is called interface Hadar um, Parizan equation. So that is circle of ideas which we are working about. Still many questions open. There are many beautiful results obtained for particular models. Very still very active area. Uh, whether we'll achieve or not our final goal remains to be seen. But we had fun for sure. And people here in Serum made us uh, feel very welcome and help us to have this fun. And I'm very grateful to everybody mentioned already. Uh, to Celine and, uh, and Olivia and to everybody who helped us and to Pascal who was not, he actually was present here, but he was not director yet. And of course to Patrick. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Christian. Well, are there any questions? Yes. Um, so a couple of questions. One is, this picture is very suggestive in that if you sort of now think of instead of time as going this way, time going up, it looks like what you're getting is what looks like a branching random walk. And is it the same, can you sort of reverse time and think of it as kind of a yeah. Galton Watson Vienna process? Yeah, 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 of course. Uh, it's a good uh, point. Yes, you can look at it on this direction yeah. and on this direction. And uh, it is time reversible, in fact. And, uh, uh, and it's time reversible in this case as well. And actually, this is a dynamic of minimizers. And when we go in this direction, it's a dynamics of shocks. And they are dual to each other. So it's duality in their distribution. So it's a, a, a exact time reversibility here. Thank you. So you mentioned that one half corresponds to independence. So does it mean that you have a kind of like significantly different behavior above one half and below one half? Yeah, it's a very good question. Uh, actually, uh, since I mentioned already that what we're playing around is coalescing fraction of Brownian motion, it corresponds to maybe a question about behavior of this coalescing fraction of Brownian motions for Hertz exponent above one half, which is normal Brownian motion and uh, below one half, where it, uh, one half is Brownian motion, above is uh, above and below, but so uh, above one half, it is uh, positively correlated, and below it's negatively correlated. And uh, I would say that in this family, so I would like to think about this for alpha greater than one half. I have more clear idea what's going on there. Now, uh, whether you can do it for alpha less than one half, it's, uh, it looks like it's plausible. I don't see why not, but I have not as clear picture. And I will give one example of why it, it is not always the same. There is, a, there is a question of whether you can construct fractional Brownian. Fractional Brownian motion is an object which is, uh, was introduced basically by Paul Levy in 50s, but it normally associated by names of Mandelbrot and Ness who actually made just little remark about formula of Paul Levy. Uh, and uh, uh, that's, I think, is true assessment. Uh, but this is a Gaussian process with stationary increments. That's exactly what they did. They did stationary increments uh, in the bottom S. And uh, it's ugly because it's not Markovian. But you have to study it because it's, uh, it appears in nature, in finance, in many, many things. You just have to do it, not because you're nasty, but because it just exists. And uh, so people ask the question, can you construct them as a limit of random walks, like we normally do it for Brownian motion? And it's a beautiful paper uh, by Scott Sheffield and uh, Alan Hamon, where they, they constructed for h greater than one half. But uh, they're asking uh, and, uh, whether they can do it for h less than one half, they don't know. I mean, there is a, it's plausible, but they don't know. So it's, uh, there is a subtle difference there. Thank you for your question. I think that that's a pure coincidence, but there is two thirds in uh, Delacroix, Hubert, Lebe, uh, Lelievre, Wintry model, which has significance, it's Lyapunov exponent of some renormalizing dynamical system. 
So your two thirds, is it some significant quantity or something just obtained by computation and you don't know specific meaning of these two thirds? Well, <laughs> let me, so if the question is whether two thirds in this setting and my setting are uh, connected. No, no, whether you, whether you have this interpretation of, of your two thirds as some. So I, I can give very easy explanation why two thirds appear yes. in this problem. That's, that's kind of easy. Uh, it will take five minutes, but I will not take okay. this five minutes, but it's possible to do. And actually the paper of uh, Kadar and Parizizank who came up with this two thirds, they were using scaling it for property, but exact scaling, but it's actually easy to understand two thirds and one third. Not, not as difficult. What is difficult to understand what, why the limit statistics are universal. That's much more difficult. Uh, it's like in central limit theorem that, that fluctuation square root of n is kind of clear, but that the limit is Gaussian needs certain work. So that's what is it. But what two thirds appears in different settings, and I don't remember that Dima Dolgopiad says it's just because there are very few rational numbers with small denominators. <laughs> and uh, that uh, these people mm. appear in different situations and related, not related, is difficult. I don't think it is related. But here, there is very clear understanding why two third appears. It's not mysterious, I would say. Although it looks mysterious when I tell it like I did. There are any similar numbers? Are there any similar numbers? No. In, in dimension three, oh, in dimension three. <laughs> so no, you can ask Russian. you can ask the same questions in dimension three and higher, and actually you always can ask questions about higher dimensions <laughs> in mathematical talks. <laughs> so it's completely open. I mean, people don't have any idea what's going on there. They don't even know whether this minimizer of infinite lengths exists. Even this is. I believe it does exist, but it's not known. Now the numbers will not be good. People believe that you have certain scaling behavior, maybe universal, there is some numerics about, not convincing, but numbers will not be two thirds and one third, they're ugly numbers. So good numbers appears only in dimension two. This dimension two is kind of integrable situation in many statistical mechanics models. And there are basically no integrable models be beyond two dimensionality. So it's a completely open question, even in physics. Another question? Same question, but first I'm going to reply and to answer uh, you and me. Memory. Yeah, a lot, a lot of memories. Uh, and uh, Dimitri, the, the Kalangs are fantastic, and we had a lot of hikes. Uh, I liked very much when it was Friday evening, or say Saturday, and everybody, uh, all programs were already done, and all p people left, and I was the only one staying in the uh, Charles Malay house. And then there were me and boars, wild boars. <laughs> and that is very memorable. Night, sky, uh, stars, and boars. It's a bit scary, but... Uh, yeah, it's scary. <laughs> well, well, certain connections, so maybe you have some bond. See you. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much.